Our chapter one introductory lecture is going to consist of two lecture videos. In the first lecture video, we're going to describe the role of model organisms and their characteristics. And we're also going to talk about a reductionist approach to studying biology. So these are two um, sort of tools and methods that we use to learn about the world around us. In the second video, we'll talk about the scientific method and theories. So we're in a biology course. We need to dis define what biology is. So biology is simply the scientific study of life. So biologists are concerned with learning about the living world around them. So the fo focus of our course is mostly gonna be the cellular level, but you can study biology at any level from the cell all the way up to the entire organism, and then the interactions of organisms with the world around them. And we can even look at the impact of the non-living world on our living world. So what do we mean by living? Well, the most basic definition of something that is alive is that a living organism is made up of one or more cells. So in another way, Anything that is at least a cell is considered living. So a cell can perform all the functions that are required for life. So generally, this includes metabolism. So uh, metabolism is taking in of energy, converting it into a usable form that the um, organism that we're studying can use. Um, this might be food energy, this might be sunlight energy, but metabolism is the entire process of converting energy from one form to another. Uh, cells grow. They use that energy that they acquire from their environment and transform within their cells to grow and to reproduce. And then living organisms also interact with their environment. So this could be other living organisms, it could be the physical environment around them. So as I said, we are actually gonna focus on the cell in Biology 101. Biology 102, you get into more uh, organismal level and interactions among organisms. So we study biology or we study living things using model organisms. And much of our understanding of living systems comes from um, studying a specific organism. Now it might be one of the model organisms, it might be something different, but what we can do is use model organisms to help us understand other organisms. So basically we take the information that we learn in one system or one organism, and we apply it to related organisms. So model organisms are basically non-human species that are extensively studied in order to understand a particular biological phenomenon. These model organisms range from bacteria to um, invertebrates to mammals to plants to fungi. Um, they cover all of the different kingdoms of living organisms. And their purpose is basically to be a model that we can study. We can learn all about this model rather than studying a variety of different organisms and figuring out, well, this process does this in one species, this process does this in another. Um, we can look at one single organism and sort of use it as a template for what's happening in other organisms. Now, this is used a lot in human disease and genetics. We study simpler organisms like the mouse to help us understand human disease human genetics, but we can use a lot of different organisms. And one of the reasons that we use model organisms is um, that they're just much more simple. They're smaller, they're easier to care for. 
rather than always studying humans. That's not to say we can't get some great information from humans. And at some point we do actually have to go back to the human and say, okay, we think we understand what's going on with this disease or with this gene, but now let's look at it and see what's actually doing in humans. Because it might be a little bit different in mice, but by using a model organism, we can get sort of a big background general picture of what might be going on. So why do we use model organisms? Well, to start off, humans are complicated. We're big, we have opinions. We don't really want people experimenting on us. Um, likewise, other organisms, to include humans, can be hard to study. Maybe you don't have great access to them. Maybe they're hard to come by. Um, maybe they're endangered. Maybe you just don't know how to study them because you're not familiar with them. Well, model organisms give us that species or that individual that we can study, that we know about, that we know a lot of information about that we can use to help guide our study for whatever we want to learn. Um, while there is some debate, um, generally using animals is more ethical um, than using humans for studies. Um, we could go into a huge debate on the ethics of animal studies, but um, at some point you have to study a living system. So um, while there can definitely be problems with studying animals, there are even more problems with studying humans. Humans don't like to be experimented on. Um, and if they do, they like to set their own terms and conditions, which is completely understandable. Um, they like to volunteer for things. They don't like to be told to do things. Um, so when we use animals, we can um, sort of manipulate variables much easier than we can with humans. Um, it's also cheaper to study animals and smaller plants. Um, in general, it's a lot cheaper to feed a mouse than it is to feed a human for an entire lifetime. Um, they live in smaller cages rather than homes. They don't have families necessarily. Um, so it's just generally easier to use model organisms. So why can we use model organisms? Why can we look at a fruit fly like we have here or look at a mouse and say, hey, I think this is gonna be similar in humans or I think what's happening in this mouse might be similar in other animals like a dog or a cat. How can we do that? How can we assume that something that happens in one organism is gonna happen in the other? Well, the easy definition or the easy explanation is that DNA is a universal genetic code. So what this means is that the information that is encoded in our cells is encoded in the same format in all living organisms. So we'll learn about DNA in a couple of chapters and we'll learn that it is a coding molecule. That means that it contains information. And the way that information is contained and stored and expressed is almost identical in all living organisms. So what that means is that the function of any gene that is encoded in DNA is probably going to be really similar. Um, if you have a similar sequence, you're going to get a similar product. And that product is probably going to behave in a similar fashion. Um, and again, that's because the process of taking the similar type information from DNA uh, to actual expression in the organism is the same in all living organisms. Even bacteria, bacteria compared to a cat, bacteria compared to a fruit fly, a fruit fly compared to a mouse, um, that universal genetic code allows us to assume that functions are similar. So similar meaning related organisms behave in a similar way. And you can observe this. If you look at um, two different breeds of dog, they're probably really similar. They might have their own idiosyncrasies 
idiosyncrasies. Um, but a dog is going to behave like a dog and a cat is going to behave like a cat and a dog and a cat are going to behave more similarly to each other because they're mammals than say um, a lizard or a spider. So the more similar an organism is, the more similar they're going to behave and the more similar their molecular processes are going to be. So that's why we can look at an organism like a fruit fly or like a fish or like a mouse and say, hey, this process is similar in these three, so it's probably going to be similar in humans. Now that's not to say that everything is going to be exact. We are obviously not producing wings. We don't have tails. Um, but the genes with similar genetic basis are going to have similar genetic products and similar genetic functions. So even if our findings don't apply to all organisms, it can kind of give us a background or a basis for what we think is going to happen. Um, and then the opposite may be that what we find is actually does apply to many, many organisms. For example, we initially learned about the process of gene expression, taking the information from DNA and putting it into um, a protein, which then produces a physical product in the organism. We learned about that in bacteria. And while it's not identical in uh, animals or plants, it's really similar. And so by learning about something in a less, less complex organism, we may be to, able to apply it to a more complex. So less complex organisms can give us information about more complex organisms. And that's really important because it's hard to study more complex organisms. But once we understand a little bit about those complex organisms from the less complex ones, it makes studying those more complex ones like humans a bit easier. So what makes a good model organism? Well, basically anything that's not a human or another big animal. So an elephant wouldn't be a great model organism. A blue whale wouldn't be a great model, model organism. Even something um, a little bit smaller, like a wolf, wouldn't be a great model organism. Model organisms are usually easy to grow. Um, I don't necessarily mean plants, I mean animals too. Um, they're easy to house and they're easy to care for. So their needs are a lot simpler than a larger, more complex organism. And you can think about complexity even with plants. It's probably easier to study this little mustard plant. This is called Arabidopsis thaliana. It's easier to study that guy than a huge oak tree that might be outside your window. Um, because they're small, they don't take up nearly as much space, their nutrient requirements are not nearly as great, and they don't take as long to mature. A model organism also is gonna have a relatively short life cycle. Now this is so that your experiments don't take as long. So if you want to study um, a human disease, let's say you wanna study the progression of a disease throughout the entire lifespan of a human being, you have to be able to study it for say 30 years, maybe. Um, and that's not really uh, very time effective. But if you have something that has a short life cycle where the entire lifespan um, occurs in you know, a few months, a few days even, a few years, um, it's gonna be much easier to study and draw conclusions in an applicable time frame where you can actually use the information. Uh, model organisms often produce many offspring. So this might be a lot of seeds or a lot of eggs or a lot of pups. Uh, whatever they happen to be, they're going to produce a lot. And this is important for statistical analysis 
And it's also important for just having a, a big study group. So you have lots of organisms that you can look at and look for trends um, that you might not be able to see if you only have one or two or a very few. Um, with statistics, the more of a sample that you have, the better the outcome is going to be. The, the stronger you can feel, or sorry, the greater confidence you can have in your results because you have more individuals that are showing the same trend. Um, so producing a large number of offspring is, is really important. Um, although not a requirement, but certainly very helpful, is that model organisms often have straightforward genetic analysis. So this might mean they have a few chromosomes Um, instead of a whole bunch of chromosomes. So humans have 46 chromosomes. That's a lot of genetic material, but fruit flies only have eight. It's easier to study because there's less of it. Um, often model organisms have been studied for a long time. So we know a lot about their background genetics. We know a lot about the genes that they contain, what those genes do. We know the sequence of their DNA. That wasn't always the case, but now that we have that information on these model organisms, it's really, really helpful because you can look at um, a section of a chromosome and say, hey, this is really similar between these two plants or these two mammals. And you can, determine what that sequence does in the simpler organism. Um, model organisms are often but not always less complex systems. So a mouse is still a quite complex organism, has all the same systems that humans have just on a smaller scale. Um, some of our model organisms, like for example the nematode, this is a flatworm, um, is a much less complex system and it has allowed us to study the nervous system at a really small scale and a less complex scale. Um, so although we don't necessarily mean complex as far as um, like um, the number of systems, they're often easier to study just because they're smaller, because there are less nerves or neurons because they're smaller um, or the um, organ is smaller, things like that. So I don't necessarily mean that these organisms are not complicated, um, but they are sort of less complex compared to humans or to other organisms that we might want to study. So a few of our common model organisms. Um, model organisms cover both prokaryotic and eukaryotic uh, domains. So prokaryotic organisms are organisms that have a single cell, such as our buddy E. coli over here. So you've probably heard of E. coli every time something comes on in the news about um, somebody getting food poisoning. Um, and that's because E. coli is a naturally occurring bacteria. Um, it was initially found in the intestines of humans and in other mammals. And that's why it was studied because it was actually really easy to get. Most strains, and there are many strains of E. coli, are not harmful. Many of you may even have naturally occurring E. coli in your intestines right this minute, um, and that's okay. Uh, we need those uh, bacteria in our systems, but um, E. coli sometimes gets, gets a bad rap. E. coli is really important because it has a very small genome and it's been used for a long time. It is commercially available. There's all kinds of different strains and different mutants that you can use. You can use it to study genes from other organisms. It's really, really cool. Um, and you can grow it in a Petri dish in your lab. So it uh, doesn't take up a lot of space. It's really cheap and it's just a great place to start when you're looking at um, genetic questions and other questions as well. Uh, eukaryotes are multicellular organisms. And so these are things like the living organisms you are probably most familiar with, plants, animals, uh, fungus, things like that. Um, so our two common eukaryotic model organisms are Drosophila melanogaster. This is the fruit fly. 
and he's been studied a lot in genetics. Um, we actually got the um, idea that genes are located on specific chromosomes um, by using the fruit fly. Um, this guy is the guy that shows up when you leave fruit, bananas, peaches, etc., on the counter for too long and you get those pesky little flies with the red eyes. That's these guys. Um, again, they were used because they were common. They were easy to get. Um, so they're really important because they are a multicellular organism, but they're not quite the same. They're not a mammal, um, and that's why we use the mouse. The mouse is really important for learning about human genetics, human disease, because they have all the same systems. They are a mammal, which means they're very closely related to humans, and a lot of the functions of the genes that we want to study are going to be the same or very similar in humans and mice, which means that a genetic disease is gonna present itself in a similar manner in mice. There are some other really important types of model organisms. Um, one is uh, C. elegans. C. elegans is a nematode. This is a flatworm. And this flatworm is transparent, which is really cool. You can actually see all of its organs. Um, this guy has been used to map all of the neurological development, or we, or neurological development in nematodes. But that information can be applied to other organisms that have a nervous system. Um, very often, we use uh, this guy, D. Rurio. This is the zebrafish, and he's also really cool because he's also transparent, which means you can look at organ development and whatnot. Um, very often, if we're looking for a eukaryote that's not quite as complex as, say, a fruit fly or a mouse, we'll use yeast. Um, this is um, very, very similar to the yeast that you would find in bread making, um, beer making, etc. And again, this is important because it is a eukaryote, so it's slightly more complex than bacteria, but we're not dealing with a multicellular organism yet. And then we've got Arabidopsis thaliana. That's the pretty little mustard plant that I showed a little bit ago. That is our plant model organism. So model organisms are used to study a whole bunch of things. There's a list here of um, the application of model organisms to human disease, but they're also really important in just understanding other organisms in general, other organismal systems. So model organisms are what we study, and we can absolutely study other specific organisms. There's nothing to say we can't do that, um, but model organisms help us to get sort of a big picture understanding of what's going on. Um, but the way that we study biology is called reductionism. So reductionism is learning about a larger system by learning about the parts of the system and how those parts are interconnected. So basically you start small and you understand how each of the related parts works and then you can put them together to understand how all of those parts work together. And you can sort of build up by understanding each of the parts. And you can do this at a lot of different levels until you get to an understanding of the whole. So we can look at a, a biological system from a whole variety of different levels. So we can look at the microscopic level, whether this is a single-celled organism or a multicellular organism. We can look at the microscopic level, the molecular level, and we can look at all the levels all the way up to the whole organism. Biologists study life at all of those levels, but they can, re can use this reductionist approach at all levels. 
So you can apply reductionism to a cell, or you can apply it to a tissue, or you can apply it to a single organism within a greater community. No matter what level you're on, reductionism is sort of a bottoms up approach. And we're gonna take this approach this semester by looking at uh, biochemistry, looking at the molecules that make up our living systems, and then we're going to move up to how those molecules interact, and then we're going to move up to the cellular level. So in reductionism, we can look at all levels of organization, but no matter what level we're at, we're looking at the simplest components. So we're looking at single tissues, single organisms, or in this class, we might look at single molecules. And then we might look at how those molecules interact to form organelles, which are like the parts of a cell. And then we can look at how those organelles interact to make an entire cell. So by understanding each of these little parts, understanding what this chlorophyll molecule is and how it's shaped, by understanding how those molecules interact to make a chloroplast, which is ultimately going to take in sunlight energy, and then looking at how those organelles are set up in a cell, we can get a bigger idea, a better idea of how a cell is going to function, of how a plant cell can actually take sunlight energy and convert it into usable energy.